what do I look for in a barrel horse? Horse. So I'm going to take you through the entire barn and let you guys know a few things. Nice run, Valley. Alan Taylor. As always, makes an incredible entrance. First in a bar at the age of 13. Then she broke her neck. She overcame all of that. Valen's now world champ. Yeah. World champion. Congratulations. She knew that she could do whatever she set her mind to. What's up, Lomies? Welcome back to another vlog. I wanted to talk to you guys today about something that you've requested so much. By the way, my little teeny tiny gift of a niece is behind us and she may be making just a little bit of noise because she's precious and she deserves the time she's, in her she's vlog. Awesome in vlog. She deserves her time to shine. So, when she's ready, she'll have her very own pop tag. That's a nice girl. She's wearing Friends merch right now. Ranch Dressin' Harlow merch is coming very soon. You can check that out at ranchdressin.com. Okay, I wanted to talk about something you guys have asked about a lot, and that is, what do I look for in a barrel horse? horse. So I'm gonna take you through the entire barn and let you guys know a few things. One, my main thing when buying a horse or breeding horses is, if I'm talking about breeding, my rule is, if I can buy something that's bred better than what I have in my possession, I'm going to buy it because it's going to allow for the experience to go smoother. I'll be able to pick the gender, I'll be able to pick the color, I'll be able to pick the pedigree, and I'll have access to a better mare and stallion than I would if I possessed it myself. In my case, I own some of the best mares in the world, so I do go ahead and breed them. Now, the other thing is, do I care about pedigree? Pedigree just helps me predict what I think the horse's behavior demeanor will be like, what color it probably will be, what size it will be, and its athletic ability and resume. But that's just a piece of paper. It's not gonna give me a hall pass on not putting in the hard work as a colt. One thing that I think everybody makes a mistake on is saying, I wanna raise my own horse so we can grow together or buy something really, really young. Listen, there's nothing harder in the world than to train your own, own horse to an elite level. So learning at the same time is really tough. Imagine having to learn a foreign language while teaching it to someone else at the very same time. It's almost impossible and you'll make a lot of mistakes. So it's easier if you give yourself a little bit more time to really cultivate your craft. That way you don't have to confuse animals along the way. They learn so much from us. The other thing is I think people want to have a story. And I don't mean to be shady or spill tea here but I'm an animal advocate for sure. Um, but I also love my fellow human. That being said, I think it's really irresponsible of us to say like, for instance, I've got this horse that is a Shetland pony. I wanna go run it at the NFR, or I've got this horse with all these disabilities and I want it to be some really amazing horse. That's great, that's fine. However, I think it's irresponsible of us for us to not go, this horse can only do this much because of its physical shortcomings or because I already know physically it's gonna be unable to compete at that exact same level and then compare apples to oranges. It's just not fair to the animal. However, I do believe that any animal with any physical shortcoming or people that say that that horse can't make it, I think that it always can make it. We have scamper syndrome here. We think every horse could be scamper in its own right. If I have a Shetland pony that I think is awesome and it makes to win a lot of awards and teach a lot of youth riders a lot of things, that's just as good as winning a gold buckle to us. If it's an Appaloosa that's got a really great stride and a really great handle, why not think about if it's the right size, if it's the right temperament, if it's had the right training, why not think that something that's not a normal breed could go on and go to the NFR? However, if you know already that that hasn't been done by the best trainers in the world, why haven't they done it? Well. There's a reason people don't do some things. That's because they've already tried it and it didn't succeed. Doesn't mean that you can't do it. Go ahead, be a pioneer. But you need to understand that pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their back. And you probably need to build your resume before you start diving off the edge, trying to do really crazy stuff. If you were learning to fly a plane, you wouldn't start with learning how to do backflips. You would learn how to just get it off the ground. It's hard enough when you have a quarter horse with amazing papers, perfect mama that's already won a world title, bred to a perfect stud, it's plenty hard. If you have the opportunity and a small budget is fine, Go get something that just at least looks the part. Doesn't have to have papers. Doesn't have to be a million dollars. If you have something that looks the part, if I knew that I wanted to go to the NFR, if I knew I wanted to run barrels, I would look for a quarter horse. I would find a quarter horse. Why? Because they're made physically for this. Short burst speeds to go fast. If I was looking for something to do giant arenas, 
um, where I could do barrel racing, or I also wanted to jump a little bit under English tack and go over some jumps, no matter how big I really wanted, I would go for an OTTB. It doesn't mean that an OTTB can never compete in an elite level in the barrel racing. It just means I'm putting myself a little bit behind the eight ball, knowing that it takes them a bit longer because they're physically bigger and they're built to go straight for a long time. They're not built for short burst speeds. The same thing with the Shetland Pony, the same thing with anything else. It's not to insult any speed, and I'm sure I'm gonna offend somebody in this vlog, but hey, that's okay. Battle it out in the comments. It only helps me in the engagement of this vlog. So I'm cool with it. Battle it out. Anytime that I wanna go after a goal, there's no reason for me to set myself up for all of these roadblocks. What would be smarter is for me to take my time, not rush into it. If I can't get something that's exactly for that sport, I'm not gonna go get one of my quarter horses and then force them to jump jumps. Um, not because they can't, but I know it would be a little easier if I saved up a little bit more and used a horse like Cowboy Swagger to go over jumps or a horse like Sunday Brunch. I don't wanna take Baby Flo to a Grand Prix jumping a meter 40 when I know that her body physically isn't really made for that. I wanna really use these horses um, and not abuse their efforts and make it harder for them already. Does this make sense to you guys? I just want what's best for the animal, what's best for the human, and setting ourselves up to fail is a really bad idea. If I were to go shopping on Craigslist today, I know I could find a really good horse for under $3,000 that I could start and do really well. Maybe even go to the NFR. It's been done millions of times where people have bought a horse for $600, $800, trained it themselves. What people fail to understand is how hard those people worked on the training, on the feeding, on the grooming, and on the physical strength of that animal over years, sometimes decades, until that, they got that horse really cultivated. What they also failed to respect was the amount of time it took for that person to learn the training techniques that would get them the farthest. So I hope that that helps you. Let's go out to the barn, check out these horses, and see exactly what I look for in confirmation, attitude, demeanor, all that stuff. Let's go check it out right now. Okay, so I'm out here with Lolo, and I wanted to just talk about like, size and confirmation and all of that stuff again like we just try to give ourselves the best advantage we possibly can so having a horse that's like 15 hands tall for me is the perfect size i love a horse to have a short back but we've been able to win on neffy neffy is built like a limousine pearl snap is built like a limousine girl you take the saddle off they are not cute their back goes like to here and the main thing that we have to think about is always making sure that their top line has a lot of muscle um because they they're more susceptible the longer horses the more susceptible they are to having some pain over the lumbar um when you ride them obviously we put a lot of weight on their back so um the other thing that i like is so i like them to be short here and i like them to be really long on the underline and the reason that you want a really long underline is it's a kind of an indicator for us that they're gonna have a big, long, healthy stride. So you might see cow horses that are a lot more underneath themselves. So their hips are gonna be like really tucked up underneath themselves. It's gonna be easier for them to stop, pull cattle, um, chase cows, cut a cow. They're a lot more compact. With a barrel horse, I like them to be short backed with a really long underline so that this looks like something that will, you know the action shots like Pendleton, where you feel like that. The other thing I really like in a barrel horse is short pasterns. So like really short in here. Not all of my horse, like she's a little bit longer, but you want them to be pretty short here. When a horse drops their fetlock, it's a lot harder on all of these tendons. Um, and while we're down here, let's talk about the scar. Horses with scars never bother me. I mean, Q Flowbot. Horses with scars never bother me. It's the stuff on the inside that we should be worried about. Stuff on the outside is never gonna worry you. It's stuff on the inside that you can't see that's so hard because these animals can't talk. So we try to give them as much of an opportunity, superficial stuff. I don't care about all of that. I don't care if a horse has, you know, marks here and marks there and has been through some stuff in its life. Um, as long as it's physically capable to do the things that I'm asking it to do without harming its body, um, then I'm good to go. Oh, well, she's such a sweet girl. <laughs> so, um, all of my horses have fairly small feet. They just, they're not 
out of big mares. I don't choose big stallions. Um, so all of them have pretty small feet, um, but they've all been really solid. So genetically, you know, if I find something that goes wrong um, genetically with a stallion that I bred to or a mare that I bred to, um, I obviously go a different direction. I have not actually had that be an issue. Um, you know, even this filly, her brother had a big virus when he was young and it scarred him up. Um, if you don't know, this is Flobot's twin sister. Um, so it wasn't his stallion's fault. Um, that was the fault of a virus and um, kind of a, a backlash of a vaccination. So not a big deal. But this is, you can kind of measure every single horse that I have that I like. This is what I'm going to choose for myself. I'm never going to choose, um, excuse me, I'm never going to choose like a 16 one hand tall dash to fame. Like it's just, I'm never going to choose this big, giant, strong, um, huge horse because they intimidate me a little bit. And since my injury, like I do think a little bit more about you know, what I'm walking up to. I like stuff that looks really kind and gentle and, um, and just sweet, I guess. So that's, that's the tea on every horse that you're going to see here. They're all relatively the same. Um, most of my horses are built kind of pretty, but I'll be honest, baby flow has a really pointy hind end. Um, it's not beautiful and big and like a voluptuous quarter horse hind end. It's a really fast booty so it looks a little bit almost arabian a little bit like she's just got a really sharp kind of I, some people would call it a weak kind and it just looks fast to me so when i see a horse that um has a little bit smaller rump while it may not be as aesthetically pleasing i know that that horse probably can accelerate very quickly so we can run you down here and um, we'll look at them booties and show you what i like so this is hush money girl and she is a baby flow slick by design. What you'll notice about her is that she just has a really racy look to her. Um, she just looks very, I don't know, like a racehorse. Uh, really long in the, in the head, eyes are way high up in her head. Look, she just kind of looks almost a little thoroughbred-y. Now, a lot of my horses are appendix. Um, that is what I prefer. I like a little bit of um, thoroughbred in my horse's pedigree because I've just found that their burst, or not their burst speed, but their longevity, it seems to really help with them being able to run long distances. Now, a quarter horse is known for burst speed and taking off quickly in a short amount of time. So I just feel like that's been the perfect combination here. For us, like Chuck Norris is like 16, two and a half hands tall. And he's like 1,350 pounds, okay, he's massive. He's strong and he's fast. It's taken us so much longer for us to get him trained and get him working just like we like because I believe he's just, one, he's not really our style, and two, it takes a lot of hard work to get a really big horse to really use their body um, like something like one of these little horses will do. So it just may be a little bit more challenging for him. Now he is doing a lot of things that are hard for these horses, which is to take off and reach as far as he can reach, which is just so incredible. So now, his mom, we bred her twice and we got ginormous babies. After, sorry, we bred her way more than twice, but these last two times, we really paid attention to the fact that we got massive, massive foals. So this time I called one of my cutting horse friends and I said, what's the tiniest stud you know that's very, very talented? I want a cow horse to really balance out all of this thoroughbred type bloodlines. I want a cow horse, full, just quarter horse to the bone, big old butt, teeny tiny. And he said, you need to breed her to Betty's a cat. So we're waiting anxiously for a Dawn's Victory Betty's a cat baby this year. Um, just hoping that this baby comes out like a miniature version of Chuck Norris. Definitely not the same thing again. So let's go on down the line. So here's my metallic cat. This is a baby flow metallic cat. So you just see right here, there's three baby flow babies in a row. This is a cow horse daddy. That is more of an on the money red race horse type daddy. And then Blaze and Jetalina is kind of a mix between the two. Very talented barrel horse, but also a lot of cow sense. So you can see that this horse is a little bit less race horse looking. So she's not as lean um, and she's not as like, I don't know, she's got more of a quarter horse booty. She got a thicker shoulder, she's got a thicker neck. She just got a little bit thicker everywhere, um, a little bit more square made. Um, this is because 
she is cow horse bred. So Baby Flo put a little bit of size on her, which is really surprising, but it's cool to watch the pedigree as these horses age. You notice that obviously as you breed, you start doing better and you start learning how to do it. Um, so you can get the right sizes that you need for the job that you're doing. Um, but this filly is gonna be 15 hands tall and she is so quiet and so kind. Um, but what I like about her, if I were buying a colt, what would make me buy this one is she's just so sane. Her ma her mind is so sound. She's just got um, the ability to really learn and process, and she's never in a hurry. Now, what would make me not buy Hush Money Girl, who's currently chewing on Sea Money's hair, what would make me not buy her is because she is bred so hot that she's impatient. So while she's incredible, and I definitely am not selling her um it's hard for her to really calm down and pay attention to the details where this horse pays attention to all the details but it's a little harder for her to learn how to really accelerate so everybody's got pluses and minuses let's look at one more okay, now here is loco he is a three-year-old he's still wearing his winter jammies or you know his winter coat as we call it um and he's kept outside a lot his mom was a big winner on the racetrack she is an ottb and his dad is Pepper Joe Hancock. Now this horse, um, his registered name is No Sudden Movements, just because he was so hard for us to halter break and do all that stuff with. Um, Loco, he is gonna be a big boy. His mom was a thoroughbred, so because he has those OTTB bloodlines, we expect for him to have a an ability to be able to run in really, really big arenas, be able to sustain his speed for a long time. Now, his dad, Pepper Joe Hancock, the reason that we crossed those two, is he is cow horse to the bone. He's produced, um, NFR roping horses and all sorts of NFR caliber cow horses. So we wanted to mix those two just to make sure that we had the mental stability um, to really process fine details. Also the OTTB to bring in a horse in case we wanted something for big, big, big arenas. This is a horse that we actually may sell in the future. We sell one to two a year of these babies. He may be one. We typically sell the flashiest colored one to the public. And if he were kept inside all the time, he would be jet black. Okay, so here's what would keep me buying or breeding to Nick Knack. Let's talk about it. She has a little bit longer back. She's really small. She looks like an overgrown pony. And she always kind of has a pudgy belly. Um, and her hind end is just a little bit weak, not super big, strong, um, like quarter horse kind of booty. Let me tell you, none of that has kept her from probably being one of our number one producers here. I say probably because Mojo and Cody have won so much. John and Mojo have won so much. Baby Flo has a lot more foals on the ground, so it's a lot easier for us to calculate having the BFA Reserve World Champion and the horse that won fourth at Pendleton and um, Lolo winning at the Pro Rodeos, placing at the Pro Rodeos. So it's hard to say, but in the next coming years, I think we're going to see that Nick Knack is probably one of our number one producers. Um, there's a lot of reasons aesthetically that you might not breed to a horse like this, but we know that Dr. Nick Barr is one of the coolest stallions. She's so friendly. And also her attitude is so glorious and loving and kind. <laughs> Sarcasm. So, so it may keep you from breeding to something like this, but they always tend to throw bigger when you breed to a really quality stallion. So a lot of you guys um, may not be as superstitious as we are. We're not superstitious at all, but we do love horses that have white spots all over. You can check out um, Nick Max Coggins makes her look like she's an appy, but those are just what we call money spots. Um, you can look up, I think the horse's name is, hang on, if I get this wrong, somebody's gonna roast me. Please hang on. Bird catcher spots. Bird catcher spots are small white spots, not yet known what controls their expression. Although it is believed that they are not genetic, bird catcher spots occur in many breeds. Okay, but then the second thing says that it is genetic from a stallion called bird catcher way back in the day. So who knows? But basically those are bird catcher spots. We call them money spots. We especially think the black spots on like our sorrels and our palominos, we really like those. We call them money spots forever. We will forever um, say that. But you guys can kind of see where our logic is on what I like to buy. Well, I don't buy anything, sorry. What I like to breed to and how I like them to um, appear. Basically, small, a lot of heart, fast. If it has papers, great. If it doesn't, who cares? Um, and I think I really love a horse with a story. Although, um, I just think it's, it's not fair to the animal to 
know that they aren't capable of performing at that level and yet still expecting it from them. So no shade to anybody that wants to go to the NFR on a Shetland pony, but it's not really fair um, to say, to ask of them to perform at that level when you know they can't. If you want to race a Kia against a Ferrari, go right ahead. But, you know, we know where this is about to go. <laughs> Thank you. You know where this is about to go. My bestie just made a template. Um, uh, this or this or that horse edition. It says template by Fallon Taylor too. <laughs> Best friends a graphic designer check. <laughs> I did remind her today that I was like, you do paint. She's like, hey, can you film me? Sorry, can you come film me? I go, I was sorry, like, can you come film me for a TikTok? I was like, you literally paying me to do that. She's oh. like, oh, I forget. Forget we're not just friends hanging out. Yeah. At the barn, which we are, but it like, does you know, feel. we do stay within our guidelines. But yeah, like, it does feel like yes, just friends hanging out. I will out. drop what I'm doing to film you. No, yeah, I do know that the people need engagement, so I have to make something. Like, it's it great. Is job. You guys go to my Instagram because I have a little filter too. Um, the filter, and I did it without my best friend's help. She I figured this out. She I did one I and so proud. it's really great um, just search for Fallon Taylor and then you can scan your face and it'll say which one of my horses would you ride the best and then it and then it tells the horse and then the little horseshoes come out and I'm really proud of myself okay ADHD on deck check check, check. ADHD check okay so <laughs> let's talk about what I would look for in a sale video. Now, I helped to innovate horses selling online. I, that's how, kind of how we all met, was cool YouTube videos, I would buy horses, I would sell horses, I would match horses to riders. I haven't done it in years, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do any of that, I wanna hoard horses and collect them up here, and me and my friends just ride in the backyard. Is that so bad? Let a girl live her fantasy factory dreams, okay? One thing that I did was make sale videos. Now, I wanna talk you through, if you were looking for a horse for sale, what you would look for in that video. One thing I always look for is, is the horse sweaty? Is that horse fresh or is it sweaty? When I see a horse that's got a lot of sweat on them, I think, man, that horse has been ridden for a long time. So, you know that the horse is performing something after it's been ridden. It may get fresh a lot. You may wanna see if that horse can be shown to you without being saddled first when you go to try it out. The other thing to look for from a sale video, is how much bit is on that horse. Is it a lot of bit? Is it a little bit? Is it an O-ring snaffle? Is it a hackamore? That's gonna help you determine how much that rider is actually having to pull. Because from far away in a video, it's really hard to tell how much pressure a person is having to put on a horse. Now, another thing that I like to watch is, is the rider having to really ask them to slow down? If I see a horse that's having to really be slowed down, or if a horse is being described as a free runner, sometimes that means he's kind of a runaway and we really haven't gotten it figured out yet, and he's not my style. Now, authentically, a lot of people sell horses that are not their style, and a lot of free runners know how to really work and turn and don't need you to push them. Just something to look for, though, when you're checking it out. Also, read through the ad. If a person is misspelling words like sale and sell, if they say a horse is 14, five, 14, six hands tall, um, they say things that are really um, kindergarten level things about horses that you know to be true or not true. One thing to ask is, are the papers in hand? Do you have a signed transfer available? Um, and then general questions, people should know. Um, typically when people came to buy horses from me a long time ago, they only knew the C's. Color, colic, and cribbing. I have to let you know, none of those things are really going to affect things long term. I know cribbers can colic, and I know that colicking horses can colic again, but you're going to run into much bigger problems if those are just the things that you're working on. For me, I really like to see a horse being led trotting across a flat surface, like gravel or concrete. That way I can see if the feet are hitting at the same time, or if I can see any big lameness issues happening right then. Now, a lot of people wanna say they bought a horse that was drugged or bought a horse that um, just wasn't the same when it left the people's place. I know from having dogs, horses are gonna act different depending on how the training is. So yes, a lot of people can do a lot of really crazy, twisted criminal things when you buy an animal. However, the animal's gonna react more toward the person riding it than you can do it. You can't 30-day train a horse with some elusive drug. It's gonna 
30 days with an inexperienced rider can do a lot more damage than anything else. So you may see a horse that's taking advantage of you, um, running you over, doing things that it didn't do with its past owner. That could be just from your level of inexperience. So I think taking a lot of accountability and understanding that every time we touch the lead room, every time we're around our animal, we are training it. Whether we're untraining it or training it to do something bad or training it to do something good, we're always training. I hope you guys liked these tips. I'm gonna try to do a challenge where I'm gonna buy a horse somewhere crazy and show it to you guys. I may even give it away after its training is complete, but we will see. If you guys wanna see that, make sure and tell me down in the comments. That's it for today. Don't forget to count your blessings, drink your protein, and say thank you to Jesus. See you next time.